Welcome to module 1.1, What is Genomic Epidemiology? This presentation is a part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Dr. Nancy Chow, and I'm a bioinformatics and informatics lead with CDC. This module is part of our introduction to genomic epidemiology with specific reference to the genome of SARS-CoV-2. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include a combination of case studies and training materials to help you start using genome sequence data to supplement your epidemiologic investigations. To introduce genomic epidemiology, we can start with the epidemiology component. As a public health professional, you know that epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease in a population and its application to control health problems. In genomic epidemiology, genomic data is used to aid in epidemiologic investigations. In the context of infectious diseases, public health professionals can use a pathogen's genomic data to better define the distribution and spread of an infectious disease and to apply this information to control it. In the case of COVID-19, we can sequence the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and use that genomic data for two main purposes. First, we can monitor trends at the national level in the emergence of important new strains of the virus, for example, after interventions like vaccination. Second, we can use genomic data to better understand epidemiology at the local level. Genomic data may provide evidence for or against transmission of potential clusters identified in settings like healthcare facilities, workplaces, or bars and restaurants. The data may also reveal other unsuspected clusters that warrant investigation. The Washington Post published a useful article in October 2020 that described how SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence data could be used for epidemiologic investigations. The article describes a fictional community with homes, schools, bars, and a plumber working at various households. Different substrains of SARS-CoV-2 defined by their genome sequences and labeled A, B, and C are circulating in this community. So for example, sequencing the virus collected from this person can tell us that they have substrain A. With this technology, public health investigators can identify hotspots of transmission. For example, in this cluster of cases circled here, all have the same substrain, which provides evidence for localized transmission. Public health investigators can also use genome sequence data to rule out transmission within an apparent cluster. So in this example circled here, we see a school where different substrains of SARS-CoV-2 have been found among ill children. This finding suggests that children are not being infected at school but are rather acquiring SARS-CoV-2 in the community. Another powerful use of genome sequence data is to supplement contact tracing. In this community, a plumber, shown here, is known to have been in contact with members of various households that they service. Sequencing SARS-CoV-2 samples collected from the plumber and household members will show whether all of them have acquired the same substrain of SARS-CoV-2. Finding that they all have substrain A is evidence to support epidemiologic contact tracing data, suggesting that the plumber may have spread SARS-CoV-2 to these contacts. Additional uses of this technology are to identify new introductions into a population and provide evidence for the source of the introduction. The data can be used to identify super spreading events and by identifying potentially infectious individuals through contact tracing, can limit new viral transmission. Sequence data can also be used as inputs for modeling studies that predict severity and size of future outbreak seasons. Now, let's talk about sequencing and what exactly it does. It goes back to the fact that viruses mutate as they spread. So first, sequencing provides a genomic fingerprint, if you will, of a particular virus. As the virus spreads and mutates, scientists can pick up these mutations by sequencing and looking at the genomic fingerprints. 
Scientists can then compare these genomic fingerprints for various cases in a population of interest and see how the cases are related. Whole genome sequencing, or WGS, is used to detect these fingerprints. This is a form of high throughput sequencing, which means we get sequences on a massive scale using the latest technology. Step one of this process, a patient sample is collected. Step two, genomic material, either DNA or RNA, will be extracted from the sample. This is often referred to as nucleic acid extraction. Step three, the nucleic acid will be prepared for WGS in a process called library preparation. Step four, this library will be sequenced using a sequencing platform. And finally, step five produces the raw data called sequence data. And this data will be used to generate a phylogenetic tree. Now, there are two main types of next generation sequencing technologies short read sequencing and long read sequencing. Short read sequencing technology produces short reads, which is another way of saying short DNA fragments. The most common platform in public health laboratories, called the MySeq, utilizes short read technology. Characteristics of short read technology include the data has a high accuracy and is great for large projects involving many samples. However, the equipment can be expensive to operate and maintain. In contrast, long read sequencing technology produces long DNA fragments. Currently, long read technology has a lower accuracy than short read technology. The MinION, a platform that uses long read technology, is growing in popularity in many public health laboratories. The actual sequencer can fit in the palm of your hand and can be run using a laptop. It enables scientists to generate actionable data in a shorter time frame. There are lower capital costs to run MinION and is great for sequencing in the field or in resource limited settings. And we also have to say that use of trade names and commercial sources is for identification only and does not imply endorsement by the US Department of Health and Human Services. Now, when thinking about genomic epidemiology, it is important to remember that even though we do not have sequences from every case in the epidemic process or transmission network, we can still glean important information to answer key epidemiologic questions. Here, we are looking at a transmission network where the x-axis is time. Every red circle represents a case that arises over time. You can think of these as all the true cases, whether or not they're detected by the investigation. Now, in the shaded blue circles, we are looking at the cases for which we can acquire a genomic sequence. We can call these cases A through F. In red are the ones that we do not have sequences for, either because one, we do not know if they are cases, they're undetected, or two, we may not be able to sequence their sample because of resources, logistics, or other factors. Now, removing the cases in red leaves only the shaded blue cases, the ones with genomic sequence data. They do not give us a complete picture of the transmission network, but we can see how they are related in time. Genome sequences from these cases can be represented in a phylogenetic tree. The resulting phylogenetic tree begins to infer relatedness by analyzing sequence similarities asking questions about which case is more closely related to which other case. In this example, case A and case B are more closely related to each other and they are to case C. And cases A, B, C, and D are more closely related to each other than to cases E and F. The next module will explore in much greater detail how to interpret trees such as this one. At the national level, genome sequence data are important for monitoring the ongoing evolution of SARS-CoV-2. This is an image from nextstrain.org, an open source project created at the University of Washington. The numbers of available sequences vary by state, but NextStrain can display them all in a single phylogenetic tree. We will be saying a lot more about NextStrain later in the course. For national trends, a prime example is the work performed by the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, also called COG UK. 
This is a consortium involving public health agencies, universities, and various sequencing centers, such as the Welcome Sanger Institute. Since March 2020, over 100,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes have been sequenced and applied to more than 100 public health outbreak investigations. COG UK has documented the disappearance of specific viral strains following lockdown, supporting its success as a public health intervention. They have also described the explosion of viral strains following relaxation of control measures. Now, sequencing can also be used for highly localized cluster investigations. This is another phylogenetic tree drawn from samples collected from an outbreak within a single facility. This outbreak will be discussed in detail in a later module. Two examples highlighted here include one investigation in Washington State Skilled Nursing Facility where sequencing data helped demonstrate that widespread transmission had occurred. It provided evidence to support that focusing on solely symptomatic residents is not sufficient to prevent transmission. The other example involves US Major League Baseball, where sequencing data suggested a super spreading event involving team members from a single team. The sequencing data also revealed that interactions outside the actual game played on the field were likely the source of transmission. This helped narrow down the list of activities to focus on as a potential promoters of transmission. This concludes module 1.1. The next module will start with a very basic introduction to the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit page where you can find further reading on the topic. On the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and materials are released. Thank you very much.